I'm here with Suzanne Newcomb, and we're going to talk a little bit today about modern yoga history, as well as her work with the project Are Your Yog, the role of tradition, and also a little bit about her new book, Yoga in Britain, Stretching Spirituality and Educating Yogis. So hello, Suzanne. Thanks so much for participating in this conference. Hello. Nice to see you. So let's talk, let's dive right in and start talking about yoga's history. You wrote uh, this very interesting and, and long and very thorough article, The Revival of Yoga in Contemporary India. One of the questions that I had for you just was, you know, based on this research, this historical research um, that you've done, what are three misunderstandings about yoga's contemporary history? Well, I think the most important misunderstanding that nags a lot of um, practitioners these days is the idea that the, there's a need to find an authentic, pure tradition. Mm. And the more you look at the history of yoga, the more you realize that it's always been a history of interactions and entanglements. And there are certainly ways to find authenticity in your practice and authenticity in the tradition um, that are respectful to India and um, other practitioners, but there's not a pure tradition. And to some extent, what's authentic and what's unauthentic are, are kind of a, a personal judgment rather than a historical record issue. Um, that, that, that's the first um, common why misunderstanding. Do you, why, why do you think that people are so eager or feel the need to have this idea of a pure tradition and, and, and it's hard for them to embrace that idea of a discontinuity within, within the larger idea of tradition? I think that the, so many of, um, if we're talking about particularly the contemporary modern yoga practitioners in Europe and kind of the, the, Anglophone developed middle class global culture. Mm -hmm. um, I think so many of the traditional systems and traditional religions have been disrupted by forces of globalization. Right. And these forms of practice have really come into their own since the 1960s, which saw this huge rupture in any kind of um, authority, particularly religious authority. Um, although you also find, of course, pockets of revival in the religions. Um, so I think people people want to know that what they're doing has a history. They want to know that they're not just making it up. Yeah. Um, and I think there's good reasons to to trace back the more modern history and realize that that there are traditions within these more new forms. Um, but it's it's a balance between accepting what your experience is and looking for looking for something that can give you a justification that maybe is more of a narrative than actually in the historical record. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then the second what uh, misunderstanding, what's the second misunderstanding that you were going to mention? Um, I think the idea of, of the commercialization and um, how, how do you know if a teacher is a good teacher? How do you train a teacher? Um, how do you get... Uh, how do you get uh, enough money to live as someone who's doing a spiritual tradition? These aren't new problems. And most of my research has been in the kind of 20th century, late 19th century. But in Britain, the first questions of like, how do you know if the yoga teacher is qualified or not uh, appear in the early 1960s in the newspapers. And, mm -hmm. and they kind of say, if you have a yoga teacher with a qualification, how do you know if that's, that's probably not the kind of person you want to be teaching yoga, if they've got some kind of certificate from um, a college. Yeah. But then should we be spending, in, in particular, public funds or, or your health insurance dollars on someone who has no qualifications whatsoever? Right. So what is the balance between um, knowing someone has some kind of competency and also understanding that it's, it's not necessarily a subject that comes under certification as a normal kind of degree or accountancy certificate. It's not quite the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So does, um, so does, are the stakes behind that knowing that, you know, the commercialization of yoga is not new. Is that, um, is, the, is there a way that we could see that the knowledge of that sort of as, 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 I don't know, I don't know what the right word is here, but kind of um, 
toning down this sort of very vitriolic kind of argument that we're seeing a lot that, you know, the commercialization of yoga is, is sort of bastardizing yoga. Um, and I, I feel like what you're saying here is that, that actually this goes back much further and it's nothing, it's nothing new. And, and, um, it's nothing new, but I think there's always a tension between how do you make a living, um, from something that's supposed to be above concerns for materialism right exactly and if you don't have a culture where people go around begging for alms and that's acceptable um what are the acceptable strategies of having a, a decent lifestyle and um and also maintaining some kind of ethical framework that you're trying to both practice and teach mm. and and so these aren't new issues um and i think they're just as much of a problem in contemporary india as they are in any kind of western context mm. okay so yeah. so now for our third misunderstanding um I think for the third one, I'd, I'd pick up in my current research, I'm thinking a lot more about bodies and what an Ayurvedic might, body might be, what a Western biomedical body is, and also what a, a, a tantric yoga body kind of chakra model is. And in if you're looking at the historical records, there's not really a huge attempt to integrate these bodies until the 20th century. I see. And then the yogic and the Ayurvedic bodies um, start to appear in manuals in the early 20th century and maybe late 19th century as as being visualized together but i think that what you get a lot more in contemporary practice is people just trying to understand these concepts and when you read the text um of articulating these traditions it, it's more of models of understanding the world that makes sense based on your experience and it's it's not like a map that is right or wrong yeah um it, it, it's kind of layers of interpretation and metaphors that may or may not provide you the insights that you're looking for mm -hmm. i think that's a really important insight and and i actually i want to come back to this question of of the different bodies and 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 maps of of or, or metaphors of, of of experience and so when we get back when we come back to the question of ayurveda and the work that you're doing um, with this project, are your yoga? Then, then I think we'll 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 readdress that. But um, I want to now move into three sort of you know this is the second question of threes, and um, and this one is sort of about three either figures or moments within the historical account that have been that are generally kind of lost or forgotten or not included in in the more popular historical accounts of of yoga's history. Well. I think that um, Elizabeth de Michelis has done an absolutely fantastic job in defining there's something important called modern yoga and Vivekananda is widely considered to be the, the first person to initiate this movement for good reason. But I think that um, Vivekananda's, the way he set up his organization in India and also Aurobindo's um, revolutionary yoga have been really undervalued in in redefining yoga for Indians as a revolutionary um, strategy for self-rule, both internally and on the national level. And so the Indian understandings of, of what yoga is in the contemporary context are, are very much about the colonial global relationships and drawing aspects of their traditions out that could address the power imbalances and, and problems of the colonial context. Mm. So one of the important forgotten aspects of how yoga was revived in India in the early 20th century is how it was an integral um, reaction to colonialism and the mismanagement of Indian resources, the famines that plagued India because um, some of the um, Indian crops were being diverted for British purposes. and also, um, the injustice in the way the, the management was being done externally. Particularly, Vivekananda was really inspired by the suffering of people in the famines in India. And when he set up his Ramakrishna um, maths in India, social service in a kind of, something that might be more, more familiar to the Christian missions, but providing materially for the health and well-being of the Indian people was very much in his mind. Mm. And this has become a, an important theme for a lot of guru 
based ashramic organizations in the 20th century in India. But the idea was that yoga was about this kind of karma yoga, this kind of service, the seva, um, was a reaction to colonialism and a reinterpretation of yoga to some extent to meet the needs of that he saw his, his country needed. Mm. Um, and also very much wrapped up in that is Aurobindo, who, who reinterpreted yoga in a much more militaristic way, um, focusing on, on Krishna's uh, battle while he was imprisoned. And then after he got out of prison and, and retired to, to Pondicherry, he created this vision of um, uh, both individual and kind of greater human potential advancements, um, reworking the yoga tradition again in response to colonialism and globalization and, and how, does this, how is this a meaningful tradition for the problems that faced his society at that time. So I think that um, it, the way yoga is understood in contemporary India and the way it's come into the globalized context is very much relating to the contemporary power struggle struggles and making what has always been a very complex and dynamic traditions more, more than one tradition relevant to meet the needs of today and, and and we're still seeing new ways of working that in a kind of post-modern neo-colonialist neo-liberal contemporary society yeah yeah so I want to ask a follow-up question about Vivekananda, um, and actually maybe I even have two, um, but I, I, I suppose they're they're connected in some way. One is, you know, what what aspects of yoga were sort of highlighted in the the kind of I, I don't want to say innovative, as in you know it's completely new, but uh, what was sort of highlighted in terms of the philosophy of yoga? What was sort of downplayed, um, you know, based on what was needed or necessary at that time in terms of you know how, uh, according to what you're saying, the like the socio political needs, and then also you know what in what way you mentioned in the article that Vivekananda sort of made yoga palatable in the West in a certain kind of way. So. Um, how did he make yoga palatable for the West? And it was that different from the message that he was um, delivering in India about yoga's um, uh, essence? Um, well, I think that the, the, there is definitely a split in Vivekananda's message. Um, and when he went to the America and to Europe, he was talking about um, a, a kind of, united spiritual tradition and how he was one of the first people who really invited non-Indians that they it, it would be okay to draw from the spiritual traditions of India mm -hmm. um, and also that this doesn't necessarily represent a betrayal right. of of being European um, so that was quite a seminal moment in kind yeah. of inviting people who are not Indian to to join Indian spirituality in some way, and and he took disciples um, back to India for for that purposes. But I think then when he was in India, he saw the needs of his people as not so much spiritual enlightenment, but just physical and basic health and well being yeah. needs. Yeah. And so meeting meeting the responses to making sure people had enough food and healthcare and um, the basic infrastructures of, of having a healthy society were more important to India at that time. So a lot of his efforts, he also established a very traditional um, ashram in India, but a lot of his efforts were also about public service, which in some ways was new for religious organizations in colonial India, at least. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So um, then, are we on? Are we on number two or number three of our <laughs> of our? Um, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I think maybe number two. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I, two either way, it'll be, be it'll be fine. <laughs> um, in my research for the Ariog project, um, I'm exploring this interesting case of a of a 1938. Um, rejuvenation treatment of Pandit Malavia, who was the found, one of the founders of um, Benares Hindu University. Mm -hmm. And he was a very prominent Congress politician. And sometimes he supported Gandhi, sometimes he argued against him. Um, he was under house arrest for some time. So he was, he was kind of an international figure as a politician. And he was getting old. Um, I think he was 76. And he was finding all his 
his political and educational duties getting him down. And so he decided to undergo this re rejuvenation treatment. And it was very well publicized throughout um, India and particularly in the United States. It was less well publicized in Britain, um, where he approached a, a sadhu, a, an ascetic, to provide a, a, a rejuvenation treatment, which was supposed to, depending on which account you read, um, reset his age to about that of a 20 year old. His skin was supposed to fall off. He's supposed to grow new teeth. Um, and the the more fantastic retellings of this story, um, the sadhu who, who gives this treatment um, is supposed to have lived for 250 years and have undergone this three times himself to mm. account for his long age. Um, so this was a very tantalizing yeah. press story. Um, he, he It's based on a very... Um, ancient treatments in, that's in the Ayurvedic source text of you, you go into a specially built hut, ideally, where there's three different layers and you are, it's kind of a womb space and it's intentionally a womb space. So you're kind of reborn and you stay in there for about 40 days and nights. You don't have any contact with outside air, sunlight. Yeah. You only drink the medicine and, and milk from black cows. Um, so he did this practice to, to a great extent and he came out and there's before and after pictures in the papers and he, he does look like he's gained some weight and is much more well rested. Really? Um, yeah, he wow. does. I can, I can give you some pictures if you want. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's fascinating. Um, so there, there was a lot of interest in the press and I think that this has been a bit of a forgotten incident and it got forgotten because it was 1938 and India joined the war effort in 1939 and then penicillin was widely available just after the war. And that was kind of the golden age of biomedical promise until about the 1960s when people started to discover actually maybe there's more side effects to these drugs than we were aware of to begin with. Yeah. And so, um, but you, you don't get um, in the early 20th century, the discussions about medicine and there's, there's already quite a big movement to bring Ayurveda into more state subsidy to have it a respectable, um, valued practice, particularly accessible for the rural masses of India who, who really don't have access to biomedical care. So there's this great movement to um, make registers of practitioners, to establish um, funded educational institutions for indigenous medicine. But there's not really a close association between yoga and medicine until after independence, I would say. Okay. And I think that um, this incident where one of this, the prominent nationalist leaders turned to an aesthetic for, um, for healing and for rejuvenation, not just um, dealing with a specific illness, reframed a lot of our understandings of Ayurveda and its value in the later half of the 20th century when it was revived. Because now when, when people, particularly English speakers and Europeans turn to Ayurveda, they're looking for things to enhance their well-being and longevity. They're not looking to, in most cases, address a specific disease. And although, although both of these elements are always part of the Ayurveda tradition, in the early 20th century, I think you've got this... Um, real effort to prove Ayurveda is as good as Western medicine, or there's a lot of talk about um, how, how is the diseases um, classified, what's tried dosage of theory, um, is it efficacious, um, and it's all framed almost kind of to justify itself in biomedical terms. Um, and then, I, so I think that this, this 1938 rejuvenation treatment was quite a, a marked, a marking point of a shift in self-understanding at least in certain contexts i see um i mean ayurveda is still definitely the, the the point of call for people who have health problems in india um particularly um in depending on your who, who you can access right. and and it's also important to note that there's there's a strange relationship in indian indigenous medicine between um the official vadia and and hakims and the, the lineages of medicine and the kind of popular whoever is the nearest person who might be able to help. And I, I think there's quite a, a long tradition of asking holy men for various remedies. And it's also quite clear that the um, sadhus exchange herbal information, they experiment on themselves and are some of them um, acquire reputations for being quite competent um, 
uh, healers in various respects. So I think this has been going on for a long time, but it, you don't really get this overlapping with the idea of, of medicine or this is something that India can offer the world until um, probably, I mean, maybe this instance in 1938, but really then again in the, in the 1960s, 70s, um, there's this kind of shift. 